I'm really pumped to be here because, um, as we just said, I'm originally from Cincinnati and I try to stay on top of what's going on in Cincinnati as much as possible uh, with the innovation community here and it's just blowing my mind right now what's going on and, and sort of the energy of today and this entire conference. So, um, big round of applause you know, for everyone who's putting this on and pouring themselves into making this work. I think, you know, everyone who's putting on this conference right here is how and why an innovation community succeeds. Uh, so, it's, it's really cool. Um, so who am I, just real fast, I'm uh, the co-founder of a company called Picture Life, I'll tell you about that in a second. President of the New York Tech Meetup, I'll tell you about that in a second. Uh, advisor to a VC firm called uh, Flybridge Capital Partners, based out of Boston, New York. Creator of an office hours platform called ohours.org, it's a great community to meet interesting people and, or share your expertise and time with other people. And uh, you can get in touch with me on, on Twitter at at Internet. Also, yes, a big Reds fan. I was here for my 30th birthday, which coincided with uh, opening day, and while we lost in extra innings, it was still pretty awesome to be here. Um, so, Picture Life, real fast, uh, this is my company. It's uh, a really amazing product. You should download it right now if you have your iPhone out or Android or uh, even your laptop. It's cloud storage and backup for photos. So, it's uh, iPhoto and Dropbox if they had a baby. Uh, and it was awesome, that's what we built. Um, it's been a lot of fun, and uh, it's, it's what I do during the day. Now what I do in the evening is this thing called the New York Tech Meetup. Uh, has anybody heard of the New York Tech Meetup, by chance? Awesome, so I'm really glad that none of you have, um, because I'm gonna be talking a lot about it. Um, so the New York Tech Meetup was founded back in 2004, and it was founded by the guy who founded meetup.com. Everyone's heard of meetup.com? Okay, so Scott Heiferman founded meetup.com, and in 2004 they made this pivot where they said anybody can host a meetup. Before, they went on meetup and they said, okay, there's gonna be a gaming meetup at this bar, and then if you went to meetup.com, you saw that, uh, and then you just show up. It was curated by the folks at meetup. And then in 2004 they decided, nah, it should be community organizers should be able to go on there, create their own community, and then and then invite people out and, and manage their own little communities. And so he ate the dog food and created the New York Tech Meetup, and one other person came. And this woman was named Don Barber. And uh, it was just held in this conference room. Um, digital photography in 2004, I guess, was kind of crappy back then. Uh, but it was just held in the conference room at, uh, at the Meetup headquarters. And over the next couple months, a few more people came. Uh, fifth one in, this guy named Josh Schachter came in. And the whole idea was just, hey, let's talk about what we're doing. Let's show off the cool things that we're building. Josh was building this thing called Delicious. He's like, I'm going to show you what tags are. Like, I'm going to invent this thing called, called tags. And it was still like seven people in a room. Um, and just showing off what they were doing. So fast forward to... Uh, 2013. Uh, we're actually 32,000 members now. Um, I, I got involved in the organization. Well, I started attending in 2007, and then in um, December of 2008, we were about 7,000 members, and that's when I, I started uh, as, the, as the president and organizer of it. And so uh, the format has really not changed all too much uh, from that room full of people just kind of showing off the cool things that they're working on to what it is today, except for that the room is a little bit bigger. Uh, we uh, operate out of the Skirball Center in, at NYU. It's an 865 person theater. Um, it sells out in 10 minutes every month. Uh, so imagine, <laughs> imagine this room, 10 minutes every month. Uh, uh, having a bunch of nerds, uh, CMOs, um, everyone, everyone in the in this innovation community, which is very broad, coming into one location, and then up on stage, we have everything from it's pure demos, never a PowerPoint. It's only just show us the stuff that you've made. So, for instance, uh, this was actually two nights ago. These are two students who built a. Anybody know what Git is? It's a code repository. So they built something that, um, using an Arduino uh, board, it's an open source hardware board, uh, they made it so, uh, they attached a breathalyzer to it, so you couldn't commit code while you were drunk. <laughs> uh, and they demoed, they demoed that on stage, which is really cool. 
But then you also have something stuff more a little bit more serious. Uh, this is the CTO of MongoDB, which is a, a database technology company based in New York City, writing code up on the screen um, and demoing how MongoDB works when they just released a search feature. Uh, this is one of my favorite. This is actually a screenshot from a video I took, so that's why it's blurry. 2000, uh, February, March of 2009. That's uh, Naveen and Dennis from Foursquare unveiling Foursquare for the very first time in front of a community. Um, and half, that's like what the app looked like at the time, but um, the other half of it was Dennis just talking about how he wanted to make Zelda a real world game, and that's why he was making. Um, making Foursquare. Um, this was last, uh, last January during the SOPA and PIPA debates. Um, this is outside of Senator Gillibrand and Schumer's offices. Uh, the police official count was 2,500 people in the streets, um, not doing what we do every month. You know, it's really easy to get everybody to the same place the first Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. This was a totally new area for us, but we managed to take our community and get 2,500 people. We think it was about 3,000. The police always sort of scale it back. But still, 2,500 people in literally in the streets of New York City uh, who were, again, of all walks of life in the technology community. And it's even grown so much that, again, this is from two nights ago. This is, we now have our first ever a cappella group <laughs> called NYC Sharp. <laughs> um, made up of people who work at tech companies. So it's pretty crazy. When, you know, that, that two people in a room in 2004, there were more than two people in the New York tech community back then, but it's sort of representative of where the community was at then. And now, uh, you know, kind of this is where we've come in New York City. And the New York tech meetup itself is now the biggest, by far the biggest meetup in the world. And it just got actually leaked uh, that, uh, you heard of the Barclays Center? It's like the U.S. Bank Arena on steroids that Jay-Z just made. Uh, we're going to be doing that in October. Um, so it's crazy. Um, and so, you know, the thing I want to talk about is, is not so much the New York Tech Meetup story, but more the, the larger story of, of New York City and how we went from a, a place that was felt a lot like this, felt like a, a lot like the core... Um, ingredients that you have here in Cincinnati and, and ballooned out to something that is truly, truly vibrant. You know, we just had a few, few startups back then. You know, you could name them. I had a really crappy startup in 2006 and I was like on that list of 10 startups you should watch, <laughs> right? And it was nothing, but because there was nothing going on. Uh, so now it's, it's, it's a lot more. Here's, um, Here's some data. There's this uh, organization called the Center for an Urban Future, and uh, they put out this release called New Tech City, and I'll show you the URL in a second. It's, it's worth a read. Uh, it's a little bit too focused on the financial, sort of VC side of the, the innovation community, but there's some interesting data, and you can see, I think that you know, VC investment is indicative of, of a vibrant community. And this chart here, how we're growing next to Silicon Valley, New England, which you know, includes Boston. Boston used to be its own category, and now uh, you know, New York has turned into this, this, uh, this gorilla. Um, zero over there, zero accelerators in 2008 um, to 12 uh, last year. Um, none of these individually, are, I think, are all that important, but they're all um, in indicators of, of activity, right? If you have cool stuff going on, incubators pop up. VC investments rise. Um, people who went to HBS start businesses. Um, neither one, of, none of these are all too important individually, but collectively they tell an interesting story. Um, square footage used by by startups, job growth, membership numbers outdated. Um, so, so I I want to move on to a question, and then I'm going to kind of blow through this next part a little bit, and then I really would like to to open it up to more of a conversation. Because raise your hand, if, how, how much would you love for Cincinnati to be that vibrant community that, uh, that we wanted 10 years ago? Yeah, right? OK, good. So this is going to be an awesome conversation. Because that's kind of like where we, we were sitting here thinking, damn it, how can we make, 
How, we, we saw the vision. We knew what we wanted. And, and the, the really exciting thing is that we made it happen. Uh, it's hard to believe standing here now that, you know, 10 years ago or, um, you know, we were thinking, how can we make, uh, how can we make New York on the map? People would laugh at us in Silicon Valley when we said that we were a New York tech startup. And now, you don't hear of a single New York tech company going there, but they are moving to New York in droves. So that desire that you have, uh, I think we can have a great conversation about that. So can Cincinnati do this? Yes. Um, and I think there's sort of three, um, three keys to, to this process. The first one is everyone in this room, because we have a very diverse room here, right? How many people work in nonprofits? All right, how many people are engineers, developers? All right, how many people are designers? All right, how many people are service providers, marketing, PR, um, lawyers, real estate agents, consultants in any form? Okay, um, right, so let's get a good definition of what the landscape is. And then something that we did in New York is kind of know what our roles were, know what role we had to play in achieving that goal. And then everyone sort of has to get on board. Um, and I'll, I'll, talk, I'll talk through that. So first, the players, um, you have the makers, right? So the people who write code, do pixels, um, people who make beer. Uh, you have funders, you know, people who write checks, service providers, and actually, the one that people usually forget is you also have the media, right? The people who are telling the story of what's going on in Cincinnati. Who's, who's getting the word out that something special is going on in, in Cincinnati or whatever city you're in? Very important key, uh, key player. Um, and I feel like almost everybody else in the ecosystem can sort of fit in to one of these, these four. So again, who are, who are these makers? Um, I define it as somebody who has technical skills and they use them for themselves. So uh, you might be a maker, you might have those skills, but um, you know, if you're at an agency and you're doing it for a client, um, you're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for somebody else. And so you're more actually, I think, of a service provider and there's a very important role for you there. Uh, and you have the ability to be a maker, but I, I define the maker community as the people who, who have used technical skills to make things for themselves out of the joy, joy of making. Um, the funders, it's very simple what they do. They invest money. That's what they are. They have a, they have a checkbook. Uh, and the service and the providers, um, they, they're the ones who are helping the makers do what they can't do, right? They're the ones who are doing the legal work or the PR work uh, or helping them find real estate or helping them with marketing. Um, and then media, it's as you'd expect, it's traditional journalists and tech bloggers, but it's also people who have an audience just outside this immediate audience here. And I think um, we can talk a little bit more about it, but you know, one of the things we saw in New York is that, that our, the way our story spread was that we weren't on, you know, Dennis and Naveen weren't on Gap ads in, uh, in the subway overnight, right? The story of Foursquare got pushed into the, the restaurant community before it got pushed into the mainstream community, right? And so it, it's not always, the, the media isn't always who you think it is. It's the people who are sort of talking about stuff to an audience that isn't your audience. Um, all right, so you know, in terms of these roles, I'm talking about roles, uh, starting with the makers, the number one role here is, is just to make stuff. And, and uh, it sounds obvious, but communities, I remember this you know, as New York was sort of coming up, you have all these people trying to get the attention of the people who have the skills, right? Come work with me on this startup, do my thing. Um, focus on this thing that I think will make a lot of money. You know, I'll give you, I'll give you investment if you do this other thing. What I mean by make like nobody's watching is make what inherently makes sense to you, you know, what you think the world needs, and try to drown out, uh, especially in a community like this where you might be a real small mi minority, right? The people who actually have technical skills are, are always the minority, and especially in, in, a, in, a, in an upcoming, you know, it's still that way in New York City, but, but even in a community like this, it's even 
uh, it's even more exacerbated. And you just have to, you have to push everybody to the side and just make the things that you want to make. And it's hard to do because people are convincing and people are selling you on their dream and people are writing checks from their own bank account. Um, and it's important to actually resist that because it's, it's, the, it's, it's the projects that you dream up of that always are the ones that end up being the, the big ones. So after that, you have to find a support group, right? And not just a support group, but people that you can be sort of an own, like your own open source sounding board, right? Find other people who are making things and hang out with them and make sure you are, you are sharing. That's the story of the New York Tech Meetup, right? It was, I just want to get other people in the room who are doing cool things, and I just want to see what they're doing, and it's not so we can do a business development partnership. It's not so that we can, um, you know, maybe win a pitch competition and get some money. It's just because it's intellectually stimulating to be around other people who are doing interesting things. And that's, that's really where time needs to be spent, is in between makers and other makers. And, it, and I don't care if you write code and the other person makes beer. Like, hang out with them. You are going to learn something interesting from them. You are going to be inspired by them. But you are speaking more the same, same language as makers than, um, than a VC and a developer. <laughs> uh, you'll, you'll take more away from each other, and more awesomeness will occur in your community for that. Um, and now, you know, this gets into the storytelling part of what's going on in this community. The next step is to really make sure that you're uh, promoting the cool other makers in your community that you see. Right? There's a problem uh, that um, people who build things are generally very bad at promoting themselves. That was just talked about in the last uh, session about you know, marketing. Right? It, it, it is true, because what would you rather do if you're really passionate and you want to be making things? You want to go back to making things. It, it takes work to tell your story. So you know, the best thing that we can do is tell the story of others. Right? Others that we admire in our community, other people who inspire you, and make sure their story's getting out. Be enthusiastic about the, the cool thing that you saw that somebody else was making. That really helps. And when it comes time um, for you to be that person that people are speaking about, you've got to be OK with being in the spotlight. A lot of people just don't even want it. It's, forget about putting in the work to be in the spotlight. They don't want to be in the spotlight. And for this community to succeed, the makers have to be OK with being in the spotlight because they are the only ones who should be in the spotlight. They are what this drives this community. At the New York Tech Meetup, uh, you know, I'll have people raise their hand how many people are engineers, and it's about 10% of the audience at the most at any given time. But 100% of our content is geared towards that community. It is the center, it is the lifeblood, it is the only community that matters. And what I mean by that is every community, every component obviously matters in some way. But without the people who actually build shit, no one else would be there. They would have nothing to do. The service providers wouldn't have anybody to provide for. The media wouldn't have anybody to write about. The VCs wouldn't have anybody to fund. You know, and, but the one thing you can't replace are the people who are actually making things. So you have to be OK with getting that spotlight, because it's the job of everyone else to put you in there. Um, and lastly, and this is something that I think has really been beneficial for the New York community. And we've done it with the New York Tech Meetup, but I mean, much more broadly than just our organization, which is using your skills to make your city a better place. We have this thing called NYC Big Apps Competition, where there's a bunch, there's an open data competition. Is data, is there, is there an open data movement here in Cincinnati? A small one? Um, it's really, really important. I'm looking at you, Greg Landsman, um, to, to make sure that data is freely available from the city so that the making community can actually make services better. There is a better app for the buses to make. There's actually a pretty good bus system here. I used to take it when I, uh, after high school, I'd come downtown on the buses, and they're really great. But you know, I, I don't know how it is now, but you, it was really hard to find good information about the routes and the timing. And sure, there's some government-made website that some crappy consulting firm, I hope you're not in this room, made. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but like when the data is open, right? You have a really awesome app in your, on your phone or a really awesome website you can go to. Um, and I think New Yorkers did a really good job of 
rallying around the open data movement, but even before there was an open data movement there, and just making cool things for the city or getting involved in public service. And the, the event that I saw promoted during lunch, that's a perfect example. That's so awesome. Like, everyone should be there. Because um, just that opportunity to kind of represent the tech community to a broader audience and say, hey, we're here and we're doing good in this, this city, it goes a long, long way. The role of the funders, um, I don't mean to be insulting, but I see this happen a lot. You know, your job is to be okay with not being the center of attention. Um, what I mean by that is there's, an, there's a tendency to tell the story of money. Who got funded? What's fundable? How many VC deals got done in your city? That chart I showed you, right? They put that right in the middle of it, because that's a big, important graphic. And so the business courier, or New York, it's Cranes New York, calls you up, you're an angel investor, you're a VC, and they want to hear, they want you to talk about the deals you're making, the fundable companies that, that is going on. And it's really hard not to talk about that. That's what you do, you know? So it makes sense to talk about it. And people are enamored with the money side of, of innovation. People get rich, right? You could be Mark Zuckerberg. Um, Fred Wilson is super famous because he has a blog. Um, <laughs> and um, it, it, it takes some self-control. But I think actually, to, you know, to Fred Wilson's credit, he could have been a lot more of the story of what was going on in New York than, um, than he, uh, he took, right? You have to be really good at talking about the makers, the people who aren't making things that are fundable. What is the last thing that tickled your brain that you didn't want to fund, that you never thought you'd fund, right? And chances are, actually, it's something that 10 years later you do want to fund. Like Bitcoin is a great example. Fred Wilson actually just invested in a Bitcoin-related company. But you know, he's been talking about it ever since it sounded even more like a crazy, non-fundable concept five years ago. So you know, the, the funded community has to get really good at talking about these unfundable things. Um, and lastly, I think it's really important that when you are investing in things that aren't companies, when you're taking money out of your fund, so for sponsorships, for instance, get out of the way. New York Tech Meetup has really benefited from having uh, the VC firm of DFJ Gotham, uh, one of our funders from the very beginning. Um, it's been really, really important, and they ask for basically nothing. I can tell you they've gotten a ton of deals through this, uh, a ton of deals, but it's never by saying, hey, I want to introduce myself at the beginning of the event. It's never from saying, like, you know, NASCARing our event, they just do it, right? And then they, uh, then they know to get out of the way. And so then folks like me who, you know, make things <laughs> and other people who are involved in the organization or get up on stage, they tend to go speak very highly of this organization and it all comes back to them. But it's a little too cliche to, to both be the, the sponsor and the organizer. And I see this in a lot of different cities and in New York and less successful organizations and less successful not just in terms of size but impact on the community. It's because the funders are trying to be a little bit more too out in front. Um, and, and lastly, I think it's don't give people an easy pass. A lot of, you know, a lot of people who are funding are very passionate about their town. They, want, they wanted New York to do well. And so um, I think or they want Cincinnati to do well. And you know, having a good filter for, for you know, making sure you're not just changing your filter for what's worth investing in because you really want the city to do well. And this is for all the makers out there you know, who are trying to get funded. Don't think that just because you're a Cincinnati startup and this person loves Cincinnati and wants Cincinnati to do well, that there's a good pitch there. Because no one's going to win when you start changing your criteria for what's a worthy uh, investment based on sort of a common dream that people show, share. Uh, for providers, um, all, you, all the service providers out there, um, pro providing cheap resources is a big thing. The, the, the only sponsor who's made more money off their sponsorship of the New York Tech Meetup than uh, DFJ Gotham is Wilson Cincini, which is a big VC law firm. Again, they ask for absolutely nothing. We say thank you to them. 
uh, you know, at the event, but they've never asked us to. Um, provide us with you know, $20,000 a year, and they did before we were 30,000 people. Um, and for anybody who comes through the New York Tech Meetup, they like give their startup package away. Like initial docs, everything. Yeah, maybe they say it's like $3,000, which is ridiculously low anyway, but do you see that bill ever? No. You know, they, they've worked it out so that you can just get those docs and you can go on your merry way. Well, I, I know they have made so much money <laughs> from the New York Tech Meetup and from the broader community through this process of just giving away resources and realizing that they can, they can give stuff away. The other thing that they do and, and so many other people is just play host, right? If you are a service provider, chances are you have a bigger office than any of the startups in your community. And, um, and usually people are starving for space to like convene and meet. Um, and it's really easy for a law firm or a real estate firm or somebody to just open up a conference room, give people a projector, even get use the catering that's already at their firm so it doesn't even show up on anybody's you know, expense report. You know, there, there's ways to hack it so that you have these resources that you can just sort of give uh, to the community. And then specifically for development and design um, uh, agencies, the, there's something important that you might not be realizing, but you are the actual first level angel investors uh, in your community because you're giving the jobs to the people <laughs> who make things, right? And, and being okay with the fact that these folks are going to cycle in and out of your agency because in their free time they're going to be making things that help stimulate this broader ecosystem on their nights and weekends while they're at your, your creative agency, they might end up leaving, which sucks for you. You want their talent in-house. But listen, if they have that drive in them, they're not going to be there forever anyway. So the best thing you do is maintain a really strong relationship. And again, I can point to, there's an agency called Hard Candy Shell in New York, which basically just gave the Foursquare guys uh, UX design help early on, gave them office space. Um, a designer left Hard Candy Shell to be on Foursquare. And that sucked. The designer was amazing. Uh, it was like they're one of their most critical assets. But now they are the go-to UX shop, or one of the go-to UX shops in New York. Right? And, and not that that many people back then knew what a UX shop was, but now they do. And they're on the tip of everybody's tongue, and their, their business is just booming. Because they, they kind of they, they embrace the revolving door of makers. In their, in their agencies. Uh, and the, lastly, you should make things too. You know, we all you know, kind of know the story of 37 Signals, a development design shop out of Chicago, who eventually said, well, you know, damn it, we want to not make stuff for our clients, but make stuff for ourselves, make us better. And they came up with Basecamp and put that out there. And I've been seeing this a lot in New York, where agencies have turned into startups because they start saying, hey, you know, we have all these resources. We can, we can make, make things too. Lastly, in terms of the media, um, important for you, again, to tell the story that's not about the money. Like, there's something interesting going on here. There are interesting people building interesting things, and it's not going to get funded, and it doesn't matter. There's an interesting story. <coughs> um, and, you know, a turning point in New York was when you all read Business Insider or heard of it. So it started off as Silicon Alley Insider, like that was the domain. It was on a Typepad blog. And Henry, Henry Blodgett, he was this analyst on Wall Street. Very smart guy, got kind of in trouble on Wall Street back then. Uh, but he was still very, very smart, had great analysis. And it, it was a turning point in the New York Tech story when he thought it was worth his time and thought there was an opportunity for him to build a media company Based around, at first, it was called Silicon Alley Insider. It was, at first, just covering what was going on in the New York tech community. They only started talking about Yahoo and Google when they realized that when they did that, their traffic went way up and they stopped talking about the New York tech scene exclusively. But it started off as being, hey, we're going to provide some sort of narrative in the background. Um, 
And it turned out to be an amazing business opportunity right, for him. He, they, they were able to establish a unique voice as a, as a media company, but it started by, by telling it a smart, interesting, analytical story about what was going on in the community. And there's a big, there's a big opportunity there. Uh, but you do have to be invested in the, the idea that this community does well. You still have to be objective. You're a journalist. Um, you have to have that lens on first and foremost. But there got to be a part of you, too, that wants to see this happen. You know, it's going to argue to your editor that there's a, there's a story here that's not, not just the funding story. All right, so th th you know, that's the roles. Those are all the roles. And, and the, the critical part is everybody sort of knows their role and is OK with it. You know, the, the makers are OK with being in the spotlight and embracing and celebrating the making community. The, f the money people are OK with embracing the community that's not just about what they're going to fund and what they funded. And the media and the service providers are all about supporting them as well. And that this idea of a rising tide, that if you do that, if you make it an amazingly vibrant place to make things, if you make Cincinnati a place where the makers are connected and just making things for the sake of making things, um, and everyone tells that story, uh, I think that, that that's, there's no doubt in my mind that Cincinnati can, can become that, that vibrant place. But it, it's all about getting, getting on, uh, on the same page. And this is sort of my trial at what that page is. If everybody could just, you know, what's going on in Cincinnati? If they just kind of said this, there are funky and smart makers in this city. What they make might look like art, but one day may change the world and likely make this and this city quite rich. So get on board. Um, that's, that's my message to you all. So with that, I would love to have a conversation now about, you know, we have all these different people in the room who come from different walks of life. How does this sit with what your visions are for where Cincinnati goes? And um, yeah, and, and you know, what, what here doesn't sit well with you? Or what doesn't make sense for Cincinnati? Or if you have any questions about, more about how things evolved in New York. Yeah. yeah. Wait for the mic, monkey. Um, with, uh, uh, like I say, a new app or a new tech company, for example, um, uh, how does that uh, translate into uh, jobs, uh, the big word from the election? Because, uh, uh, you know, technology can do a hell of a lot. You know, like a, what, a five-person team, ten-person team, maybe? How does how does how do you see that like becoming like a, a thousand comp employee company? Yeah, that's a um, well. There's there's a couple different questions. There's a couple different uh, jobs. It's a great word, <laughs> but what does it mean? Um, and what I say by that is, you know, as we've become more aware of our own political power, we think a lot about jobs. So a we care about creating jobs and care about creating, you know, being an environment where big companies can come in, but we also care about telling the story of jobs. So you can be thinking about it in different ways, and, and so the answer is different. And for an example is, of that is in New York, we, we realized we were counting tech, the tech industry incorrectly. We were counting how many jobs were there and how it was growing based on uh, the number of people who were at technical companies, whereas what's the true measure is how many people are in technical jobs at all companies, right? Like for instance, the ad tech engineer at um, Hearst, publishing company, like that person is an engineer, that person is technical. So we, you have to first just broaden what your definition of your community is and make sure that you're accepting everybody and that, that even if you aren't in a tech company or at a tech uh, what's considered a tech company that, that you're, you're talking about them. And um, in terms of then job growth, you can start measuring growth uh, based on how many of those types of people are also uh, growing. Like how, um, so what you're doing is you're, I guess you're attaching yourself to the importance of technology throughout all of business versus just the importance of the tech industry inside of business. Because those are your people, and you have sole claim to them when you are um, having a political discussion in terms of the importance of your industry if you're talking to elected officials. Um, 
so as soon as we did that, we wielded a lot more power because we just had more numbers. Um, in terms of the actual growth, in terms of actual making tech businesses that then hire a lot of people, um, you know, the Something really interesting happened about 2010, which is that it, when Foursquare started and they grew from t two people to 10 people, those first eight people, they stole from other startups. That's a zero sum game, right? That doesn't help anybody. Um, and the turning point was around that time, we were getting really good at telling the story of what was going on in New York in such a way that the next 10 people came from San Francisco, right? And an, a really critical way of, of growing the industry is injecting more human resources in the industry. Because now, out of the Foursquare family, there are you know, 10 new startups that employ 150 new people. Right? Growth comes from innovators creating something, however they happen to do it, there's no formula for it, that then one day needs to hire people because their business demands it. So that's the question, right? How do you do that? And how do you do that with a limited set of people? Um, you inject more people. You train and you inject more people. You have to be recruiting into your city so that the companies that are currently growing aren't sucking talent away from, from other potential growth areas or other, other companies that could end up growing and hiring more people. Um, so people really need to focus on the recruiting uh, into the city, so then um, so that sort of growth can happen. Does that make sense? That's great, yeah. Uh, I guess the other avenue for growth would be, like, the other avenue for growth might be, you know, high school grads, college grads, for example. So, you know, just more people to, to well, bring that, into the industry. Yeah, that, I mean, that's, that's huge. And, you know, that's, to me, that's a little bit down the line. I, I think it's critical in terms of the focus of the community. If you have people who are passionate about that, do that. We are now, uh, I would say singularly focused on, as a community, in terms of projects that we're all getting involved in. It's all about, we just had a new high school that opened up in New York that is a public high school that's focused on computer science. And, you know, there's a line to be an advisor and to help this. Um, there, uh, Girls Who Code is an incredible organization that is taking high school, low income high school girls, getting them uh, coding. Because, yeah, we can continue to recruit. But what you really need is you need that, that base of talent that is grown locally. Um, and if you do have people who are passionate about that here, it's, it's actually pretty crazy. The day that we, we did this thing, it was a, an internship program where we took high school kids and we put them in startups. We wanted to show them what that looked like. And it was really difficult to get startups to, to want to do this because it's hard to, you know, you're, you're being a babysitter of really cool kids, but you're still being a babysitter. But what was really compelling about the night that we introduced it, there was a kid who just graduated from high school, who four years prior, so the New York Tech Meetup had been around longer than that, four years prior had been in high school, right? So it actually does pay back quickly. He was demoing a venture-funded startup that he was doing, and four years prior, he could have been one of those high school men mentees. Um, and so while it does feel like it's far off, it's actually, I mean, four years from now, we'll be here in no time, so it's worth doing. <coughs> I can't cough without this mic. <coughs> Picking it up. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. So you said that um, in the New York Tech Meetup that the engineering group is like 10% of your population. And you said, if I remember correctly, 100% of your content is geared towards them. How do you keep the other 90% from being bored? Or how do you balance, what does that mean? How do you balance that presentation of the content? And when you say that it's 100% of the content is geared towards engineering, what do you really mean by that? And how does that, what does that actually look like? Well, it's, um, right, it's not all, you know, the terminal being open and people SSHing into their MongoDB servers and doing demos. Um, 
But it's about sort of the, how intellectually interesting it is for people. Um, and what we found, so when I say it's, it's content that's geared towards them, it's would they find this interesting? Um, for instance, there are certain CMS platforms, which is a great business, and it's a worthy business to do. I've thought about, I actually, my first startup was a CMS, right? But it's not necessarily new or interesting or intellectually you know, uh, compelling for an engineering audience. Uh, so we kind of don't make that uh, a demo. Uh, we just kind of want to make sure that it's something that's speaking to the, uh, the, <coughs> the engineering community. Um, <coughs> okay, why aren't people bored? It's, um, it's, it's uh, because, well, hold on a second. The, the fact of the matter is that they actually don't mind not understanding anything. They are there to actually see things that confuse them. Right, if you are in a marketing role, you're at a publishing company, you're at an advertising firm, you're a service provider, and you happen to go to something called the New York Tech Meetup, you're going there to learn something new. And what I found is people actually enjoy, the, more, the less they understand sometimes, the more they enjoy it. Right? They're actually delighted by how little they, they understand. <laughs> They're like, oh, I'm in the right place. Like something interesting here, something is interesting enough here that I don't understand it. Um, yeah, uh, it's it, yes. Yeah, I mean, what two things? One is that's in some ways that's how they start to learn the language. So they want to come back. Uh, the, um, they want to come back because um, it's it's an energy. They get this energy of being around innovators. Now, they understand a lot, right? People are speaking in English. Um, it's um, they're demoing products which have user interfaces that you know. It's not like you're sitting there the entire time being, you know, what the hell is that? And like I said, most, you know, we have one or two demos which are highly technical, but most aren't. So you're not totally lost the entire night if you're not technical, but, but that one or two that you don't understand or that's a little bit above your head, it, it, it is exciting for some people to be around, around that. I mean, it's a self-selected group. They came there to see something that was called tech, right? So when they see tech, again, they feel like they're, they're in the right place. Do you think it's more important to build the creative class or to teach people technology skills? So, yeah, the, because there is somewhat of a difference, right? So, is it is it more important to inject? Um, so I recently learned how to code, so I switched on this. Uh -huh. um, I used to think that creative people, which I was, you know, business mind, but very innovative, that that was good enough. But it actually just wasn't, and that's why I decided to to learn how to code. I, I think that it, there's difference between being, a, being creative and being an actual creator. And I think that the core of the community is not the creative class. It is the creating class. It's, it, it's the class of people who just make shit. Um, and that is the center. That's, that's the hub. Uh, and, um, and it's great if you're creative and you're entrepreneurial, there's lots that you can do. There's so much that you can contribute. But, but, you, but I learned, at least the hard way through several startups, that being creative and passionate and entrepreneurial and good at convincing people that I was doing something interesting and they should be a part of it, it only gets you so far. You have to still find somebody who's going to make it for you. So you got to center it around the makers, the people who, and you got to teach those skills. Tim? Mm. Going back to Doug's real quick, how do you decide who's going to present at these things? Who's going to do the demos? Um, that's a great question um, because it's, uh, it's what, after the event, it's all people ask. Uh, and, and I say the same thing every time, which is that it's a black box and I can't tell you. Um, <laughs> it's true in the sense that you know, if you start to, we tried voting once, and that's a race to the bottom. That you get the people on stage who are the best at convincing people to, 
tweet a link, not who have made something that's interesting. Uh, so we, um, we just, we kind of, it's a black box, it's a gut feeling. It's, is this gonna be intellectually interesting to the community? Is this something, a new approach to something? Yeah, so there's this web page, uh, nytm.org slash present, and we actually have, I have a little essay there which kind of goes into the black box of, of how we pick things. But, you know, actually one way we also pick things, and this is, I think, this is important, is w or one of the things that's challenging but also rewarding is balancing, ne it's not nepotism, uh, but it is, Listen, there are certain people in this community who are busting their ass to make this community awesome, and their product might not be that interesting. I was one of them. Seriously, I demoed, before I took over the New York Tech Meetup, I demoed twice, and my products weren't that great. But I was busting my ass in the community, and that's why I got on stage. They wanted to reward me, you know, and because I, was, I wasn't asking for anything. I was just organizing bar camps and, um, you know, blogging and, convincing people that there's something special going on in New York. And the organizers at the time, you know, saw that and wanted to reward me. I wasn't chosen because my stuff was actually that good. It wasn't that bad either. So, it was, you know, they could put me on there. But there's probably more interesting things to put up there. So part of selecting it is, is sort of trying to balance how you promote, how you reward people who aren't asking to be rewarded, but um, who deserve it. Uh, but the rest of it is, you know, what's going to be interesting? How are people going to look at the world a little bit different way? Um, you know, I can, one example I can give, and I didn't talk about who demoed at the New York Tech Meetup before, but in 2007 or 8, Scott Heiferman, who founded Meetup and New York Tech Meetup, saw just a bunch of cool things that were going on where people were using technology for citizen action. Um, and so we had this, he convened a bunch of them to come demo at the same time. So sometimes we do these themes because we see, you know, as, as people who get to see a lot of submissions come in, just where we sit in the community, we get to see these trends. And on stage was this guy, Andrew Mason, who was showing the point.com. Um, and um, that was just because Scott was like, there's something going on here with citizen action. Now, the point.com was the predecessor to Groupon. It's what the first Groupon was a point submission. Um, but, you know, that kind of came across our radar and was really demoed at New York Tech Meetup before anywhere else because of using this lens of just saying, hey, you know, through all the stuff that's going on, all the noise that we see, how can we pick out a theme that is going to one day be important? Um, and so we might just group a bunch of people by a theme. So yeah, we, we choose. We choose and we try to make it as a black box as possible so we can do whatever we want. Yeah, uh, we have to wrap it up? Yeah, well, I'm sorry. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Nate. Yeah, thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs> Try to get back to this.